as Larry said, my, my name is Tyler Lay. Um, I'm a professor at Oklahoma State University. I'm going to be talking about intelligent aggregate design today. I have got a whole host of students down here that have helped make this, this possible. And so a huge, huge, massive thanks to them. Also, a big thanks to the Oklahoma Department of Transportation. They funded the large majority of, of this work. And I would not be here today without Dick Gaynor and Jim Shillstone. Um, they were visionaries when it comes to aggregate mix design, um, and they were people definitely had a huge inspiration on me. And again, big thanks to Larry, to Gary, to uh, Dan McCoy for having me and allowing me to come back to you. This is my second time to talk to some of you, um, and so I'm excited to be back. Now, why do I do what I do? Well, I personally believe concrete is the best material on the planet. Um, and I want to make it even better, though. I want to make it easier to build, uh, more durable, lower cost, more sustainable. That's kind of my, my mantra. And I help to build people and tools to make the concrete in, um, industry better. I'm, I'm going to be giving you tons and tons and tons of tools today, and I hope you can use some of them. So this is a kind of a brief overview. Of, we're going to talk about introduction of mixed design, the importance of aggregate gradation, and then something called the tarantula curve, stuff that we developed at Oklahoma State University. It's being used by a number of different DOTs and concrete designers um, around the United States and actually in um, different countries as well. So we'll start out with the basics. So I've got four things listed here. I have this question. What is the most important property of concrete? Is it workability? Is it durability? Is it economy or is it strength? And I know this is a hard question because every single project's a little bit different. But I would argue, I would argue unequivocally, of these four, there's one of them that's way more important than all the other ones. I would argue that the most important of all is workability. Because if you don't have a workable a mixture, if you don't have a constructible mixture, if you don't have a mix that can pump, that you can place, well, then it's not going to be durable because you can't build anything. Um, it's not going to be economical because you're not, again, it's going to be too costly and you're not going to get any strength at all um, because, again, you can't even build a thing to begin with. So workability or constructability, I think, is the most important thing. And we're going to be focusing on developing mixture designs for that um, in mind, workability. So how do I design a concrete mixture? Well, we know there's rock, sand, cement, and water and other additives, maybe SEMs sometimes. But, but how do I get these other three categories? besides workability. Well, for durability, that's usually controlled by your water to cement ratio, right? The amount of water divided by the amount of binder you're using. It could be using by your SCM, if you're using fly ash, slag, silica fume, or your air content if you're worried about freeze thaw durability of, of your concrete. If, if you're talking about strength, Strength is usually dominated by water to cement ratio and um, air content. If you talk about economy or how much the concrete costs, it's really about if I can re reduce that cement. If I can use local aggregates, I don't have to bring in from um, too far a distance away. And if I can minimize my admixture dosages. I know that probably made a couple admixture salesmen like grab their heart for a second, but I think admixture should be used as supplements. They should be used as we should get the mix a good, a, a good way there and use the admixtures to make it even better an add-on on top. So how do you design for workability? The one that I said is, is the most important thing. I mean, how do you design a mixture for slip forming or for truck placed or, or for pumped or for flat work? I'm not saying the same mix would be used for all, all of them. I'm not saying that. I'm saying each one is a little bit different. But how do you design for these? And this is what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the, of, of the uh, seminar today. Well, really, it comes down to three things. It comes down to your paste content. That's the water and the binder together. It comes down to admixtures. They play a critical role and are super important. And then it comes down to your aggregates. Aggregates, yeah, aggregates. They're actually crazy important. And you can try to fix a mix with paste or with admixtures, but you, if you get yourself in the right place with, with aggregates, everything gets so much easier in your concrete mixture. Did you know that aggregates typically make up 75% of the volume of a concrete mixture? 75% of the volume of a concrete mixtures are aggregates. If you ever hope to control the quality, the, re the reproducibility, the workability of your concrete mixture, you must understand and control your aggregates and what they're doing in, in, your, in your concrete. So do aggregates really matter, though? I mean, seriously, I said they matter, but do they really matter? 
Well, I'm going to show on this uh, on this screen here. Um, different proportions. We've got a mixture here that takes some coarse. It's got some sand. It's got a certain amount of binder in it, certain amount of water in it. And I'm going to show you these next mixtures. I'm about to show you. There's there's going to be five of them. All of them on a piece of paper look just like this. All of them look exactly like this. Same water, same binder, same core, amount of coarse and sand, but the gradation, the size distribution is different. What size distribution? Yeah, you know this stuff, the percent passing. You, you guys, maybe you've seen this, right? You know what they mean, right? Well, these are the secrets to getting some of your gradations right. So the, those five mixtures I told you about, but if you have a deficient amount of fine sand, and I'll define fine sand for you, this is what happens. The mix just disintegrates once you pull the slump test. Okay. If you have excessive amount of fine sand, it's look how stiff it is. Oh my gosh. It's just, you can't, that's not, that's not what you want. So you got high amount of um, intermediate, it starts to perform like this. High amount of coarse, starts to segregate, it looks like this, like this. But if you dial it in just right, it's right here in the middle. Just what you want. This is what we want right here in the center. Now, if, 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 if you look at finishing, if, if, if I was going to go in and finish these, again, if I have um, not enough um, fine sand, it looks like this. It looks like a bunch of rock covered in paste. If I have excessive amount of fine sand, it's all very nasty like this. If I've got excessive amounts of intermediate in here, excessive amounts of coarse, you see the coarse kind of coming out of the mixture. And if it's just right, it's right here. I just got muted for a second, so I'm going to unmute myself because I think I probably need to be unmuted. Just right in the middle. That, that's that's what you want. That's the ideal. So how do you control your, your aggregates? I mean, seriously, how how do you do this? Uh, or I'm sorry, why would you do this? Why in the world would you ever do this? Well, number one, you can reduce your costs. You can improve your strength. You can improve your durability. You can improve your sustainability. You can control your mixtures. You can do all five of these all simultaneously if you control your aggregates. And you're like, man, this sounds great. I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, we're going to did a whole bunch of research at Oklahoma State University. We used a whole suite of tests to look at aggregate gradation and how it looks at impacts workability, real performance of concrete mixtures, real workability performance. And I'm gonna show you data from slip form paving all the way up to flowable concrete, from slumps of zero to eight inches, and we are gonna pump concrete today. I'm gonna to show you how pumping and aggregation definitely affects pumping and help you with that. So if you're a pumper, yes, I'm glad you're on the call. So let's give you an overview of, of these tests. We're gonna use all these tests to tell us something practical about our mixtures. Can we place it? Can we drag it? Can we pump it? Can we vibrate it? Can we finish it? Ultimately, can it be used in the field? That's what drives me. Can I help you do your job better? That is what I'm all about. And, and we can if you get your aggregations right. So everything I'm going to tell you today, every single thing can be found on this website, tarantulacurve.com. It's got a huge amount of resources. We're going to tell you more, more about these resources coming up. They're free. You should use them to help make your concrete life better. So we're going to be using a whole series of workability tests. Yeah, yeah, this slump test, something called the box test, an, a rheometer, visual observations, something called the float test, and we will be pumping concrete. We have our own pump at Oklahoma State University, and I will show you about um, what we've measured out of that. So let's start out with something called the float test. And what the float test does is it ev ev evaluates the surface finishability of a concrete mixture. So we have wood forms that are three foot by two foot by three inch, right? And we're going to fill those forms up and strike them off. We're going to then come back and place three one inch diameter holes, three one inch diameter holes. Now, why would we do this? Well, oftentimes when you strike off concrete, sometimes you'll pluck out aggregates. I know when I, when I was a contractor in the past, that happened to me. And whose job is it to fill on those aggregates? The finisher. So we want to get some idea about how easy it is to fill those holes in. So we're, 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 
we're going to make these three one inch diameter holes one inch deep we're going to move a bull foot over the surface at a fixed angle at a constant speed back and forth and we're going to measure the number of passes it takes to do two different things to close these three holes and to create a smooth finish and you're like whoa what's going on let's let's look at this in action so here we are here's the concrete struck it off didn't it? struck it off um then we're going to come back with um our template come back and put three one inch diameter holes in here just like this and we'll come back on with the float and this float has been trimmed so it does not ride on the wood form it rides on a smaller area um in between and you go back and forth back and forth over the and you you measure this area you look in this area and you say hey is it smooth and did the holes close those are the two things that you look at you count how many passes did it make that um did it take to make this happen now i am not saying this is a perfect rep representation of the field that's not what i'm saying at all this is a way to quantitatively compare how many passes it takes for one mixture compared to another so let's see what i'm talking about so here's a mixture at zero passes there are the holes here is it at two passes it took four passes and everything was good we find six passes is a good number for most typical mixtures. It takes more than six, it's not good. We also look at surface finishing. This is where once we, um, as soon as we struck it off, it looks kind of nasty. Here, th this could be better, this could be better. We want something that's at least this, 10 to 30% surface texture is okay. We're not building a Swiss watch. We don't need absolute perfection. We can deal with some voids and we determined that 10 to 30% was the number for our testing. And if you wanted to do something different, you could. You could make a, a one of these float tests for yourself and you could develop whatever mixture you want. Some people in Indiana are doing this. Thumbs up to you, brother. Fist bump. Now, let's talk about the next one. We have got some pumpers um, on the call and we actually are blessed to have our own concrete pump at Oklahoma State University. Now, it doesn't have all the booms and everything, but it does the heart of this pump is the same thing that's the heart of a boom pump that would be used on a concrete bridge deck. This is the same type of stuff. Um, um, and, and when you pump concrete, there can be some limitations. The pumping pressures can be way too high. That's when cause between there's friction between the pipe and the concrete. The concrete just itself resists the flow. The mixture can also segregate while pumping. Oh my gosh. That is dangerous. And I will show you what that's all about. We made things segregate. We did some things that were pretty crazy, but um, that's what you got to do because you got to find the limits in life. If you get this segregation that starts to happen, it is dangerous, extremely dangerous. And gradual segregation causes the pipe pressures to slowly goes up until the pipe jams. If you get a sudden segregation, then um, it causes very high and erratic pressures inside the pipe. I'll show you what I'm talking about because we actually made it our own pipe network. I think of this as like a concrete roller coaster. You dump the concrete in here, it goes, woohoo, yeah, woohoo, and then down. We did it again and again and again, over and over and over. Why do we do that? So we can measure the pumping pressure. And yeah, just like this, again and again and again, it's so much fun. And then we actually measured the pressure, the pressure, of the concrete in the line at point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, point 0.4, and of course at the pump itself. But we care about what's going on in the concrete. That gives us a lot more insight. And to do that, we had to make our own pressure sensor. What? Yeah, we actually bought this GE pressure sensor for the oil industry. And we actually put it inside concrete to measure the pressure. And it works for exactly 30 seconds. Ask me how I know. We did it twice. We should have been smart enough when they all broke the first time not to do it again. That It's not made to measure concrete. Concrete ruined it. So we had to build this whole buffer chamber. This, this is basically a chamber filled with oil, brass chamber. And right here at the end, it's got this rubber membrane. So as the concrete flows in the pipe, it pushes on the, on, on the rubber membrane and we can measure those pressures in here. And we calibrated all this with a big pipe full of water. So we can pressurize it to a known pressure and know what this GE pressure sensor tells us through all this thing. I hope you understand what I just said. This is just a way to measure the pressure in the concrete as it's flowing. And we get information like this. So as the piston fires, just like that, this is, we start to see first the amount of friction it takes to get the concrete to move. 
pressure goes up. And then once we get the concrete to move, the pressure goes down. It's constant, constant, constant. And then it's no longer pushing it, so the pressure goes down back to zero. So again, we can measure this over and over again, and we can see sensor one, that's the one closest to the pump, is the highest. Sensor four is the lowest, the one furthest away from the pump, and we can see it at all these different things. Wow, isn't this neat? Well, we can do some things like segregate the concrete on purpose. What? Yeah, I know, we're nuts. We did it. And you know those sexy, sexy things that look like this? That was the good stuff. After you segregated it, oh my gosh it's crazy it's dangerous this is what you got to watch out for this is a safety issue gary was talking about this before if we get our mixes designed right we don't deal with this and it makes your lives easier and i'm going to tell you how to do that today we can also do things like paste content in the mix this is like a five and a half sack mix we couldn't pump it what goes up to six sack we could what goes up to six and a half we could pump it a lot more this is pressure over here and this is time this just shows as our sack content goes up the pressures go down for different periods of time and this is kind of what, what we want a long really nice pressure window with this mix design we can do things like sand content we all know that sand impacts pumping pressures but look at this as you increase the sand the fine sand not all sand the fine sand, as you increase the fine sand in the mixture, the pumping pressures go down. It gets easier to pump, not harder. You might say, wow, how did you figure this out? Well, iterations over and over and over again. And don't worry, we're going to make this really simple for you coming up. So how about paving? We talked about flowable concrete. Let's talk about you know, concrete like a um, slip form paver. It could be barrier wall. It could be curb and gutter. Anything like that. Does it, I mean, can we do something for that? Well, we are big paving fans at Oklahoma State University, and we designed a lot of concrete mixtures that looked like this, and that some contractors would look at them and say, like, ugh, I don't want to pave that. That looks bony. That looks scary. But if the gradation is done right, the mix design is done right, once it goes through the paver um, and it comes out the other side, this is the same concrete, this is the same project, I swear to you comes out the back it holds a perfect edge there's almost no surface voids on the um, um this is great I and mean, look this is this is the float back here we, this area coming out of the paper doesn't have a lot of surface voids at all that's what you can get if you really understand your concrete mix design but a paver is, um, is a very unique, this slip form applications is very unique because you want your concrete to be workable enough that it responds to a vibrator. But you don't want it to be too workable for it to not hold an edge. And so you really understand that balance of workability. We said, well, how does this work? So we started to look at a paver, how a paver works. We said, well, the vibrator, the vibrator is what the thing that consolidates the concrete, that gets it to be in its shape. And so we want to understand how the concrete responds to vibration. So we wanted a simple test that, again, looked at response to vibration and the filling ability of the grout. And then the ability for this concrete to hold an edge, this, this kind of ranking, workable enough, but not too workable. And the slump test, although it's pretty cool, you know, 1911, that's when the slump test was developed. It's pretty awesome that we still use it today. It tells us some good stuff. It doesn't tell us about this. It, it, slump testing, in my opinion, is not useful for paving applications. So we developed a test called the box test, which is now an ASHTO test method. Yay, ASHTO. 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches. These boxes are two L's that come together, two L's. And they're held by these very, very expensive pipe clamps. 20 bucks, Lowe's. We're using two of them. So you know we're high rollers here in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Well, you hold this box together, these two L's together, and you're gonna fill it up full of nine and a half inches of unconsolidated concrete. You fill it up. Then you take a one inch stinger vibrator, not a paving vibrator, just a handheld typical bridge deck type vibrator. You count to three as it goes in, you count to three as it goes out. You immediately take the pipe clamps off. You take the edges of the box off and you look for slumping. You look for also, is there any honeycombing that happens on the outside? Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here we go. Here is the box. Here is the vibrator coming in. The vibrator has gone in. Oh, look at that. It's consolidated the concrete. You immediately take the edges of the box off and you look on the outside. 
whoa, what are you looking for? You're looking for, if there was lots of voids here, that would be bad. That means this energy wasn't enough to reach the outside. Also, you look at the edges and you look, are they crisp? Are the sides straight up and down? Um, and this is what the measurements you take in the box test. So again, we have a, a visual ranking scale. That would be a bad box test performance. That means that concrete wasn't workable enough. That means that concrete did not respond to vibration. If we get to about here though, 10 to 30% over, overall surface voids, boom, that's a good thing. That's what we're interested in. That is a positive and we don't need perfection over here on the outside. And I told you about edge slumping. Well, you can use a straight edge up there and you can straight up measure. How's the edge slumping? And you want it to be less than a quarter of an inch. Um, and here it is um, in practice. Here's a nice straight edge. And there's where it's starting to fall over at the top. And this gives you an idea. This has been actually validated in the field uh, where people have gone out and used this type of test and then compared it to a real slip form paver. And they've seen, guess what? When they had edge slumping issues, the box test said it did. When everything looked really, really good, the box test said it did. So that's that's kind of exciting. They actually, the parameters of the box test were designed so the amount of energy that you put in that concrete with the vibrator matches the amount of energy that a typical paving vibrator puts in the concrete at a typical spacing and speed. So in summary, the box test gives us this window of workability. This is helpful when you're designing stuff in the lab, when you're doing stuff in the field, when you're troubleshooting. It's like having a little miniature paver you can carry around with you. I think it's kind of cool. So what we did is we took all these tests all of these different tests and we looked at 650 different concrete mixtures 13 different coarse aggregates four different fine aggregates from zero slump to eight inches of slump we looked at different aggregate gradations different paste contents different water to cement ratios different water reducers different admixtures ladies and gentlemen we went crazy and I, what i'm going to do here is i'm going to summarize all of this testing more than a million dollars in testing with one graph, one graph, and that's the tarantula curve. I'm gonna take everything and put it on this one graph. Now, how does the tarantula curve work? Well, this is your sieve, sieve number down here. These are your smaller sieves. These are your larger sieves. And this is the amount retained on those sieves. So when this is low, there's not very much there. When this is high, there's a lot there. And this curve actually tells you what's gonna happen at each one of these boundaries. If you go over this boundary, it tells you what's gonna happen. You have finishability problems here, workability problems here. And then it also has two other calculations it does. Something for the coarse sand and something for the fine sand. And they're up here. Don't worry, I'm gonna walk you through all this and explain it. The good news is it's simple, it's easy. We've got Excel documents that do all of this for you and they're free. Just jump in and start using them. Again, tarantulacurve.com. I've also got a bunch of videos. You can go to tylerlay.com forward slash tarantula videos. Yeah, they're not about tarantula spiders. They're about tarantula curves. And I always get this question, why is it called the tarantula curve? Well, first of all, we developed it so we can call it whatever we want, but we think it looks like a tarantula. So there's a tarantula up there. There's a leg, a leg, a leg, that's a head, that's a body. Don't get it? Oh, well, it's a tarantula. So we're going to take these type of things, this percent passing information that you've probably seen on a sieve analysis for some of your aggregates out there, and we're going to break them down into something that's much easier to use. Instead of using percent passing, we're going to use something called the percent retained. This is the same data, just shown with percent retained. And you see these little hills? They're like mountains. And so if I use a lot, or and this, this down here tells me my combined gradation. So if I use a certain percentage of this, I'm gonna shorten this mountain down, this mountain down, and this mountain down, overlap them, and that is what this curve is, this combined gradation. And that is what's plotted on the tarantula curve. I'll explain this again coming up. I hope it makes sense. If it doesn't, ask me, type a comment out or ask me a question at the end, and I'll try to explain it again. We're basically going to be picking a certain percentage of maybe your 57 stone, maybe your intermediate, maybe your sand, to get some kind of combined curve to fit with inside that curve, that tarantula curve. So let's talk about first about the coarse side over here. This is the larger stone, and why are these boundaries, why do they exist? 
So um, here's the plan. We're going to use these workability tests to find how the gradation impacted their performance. We have strength. We've got durability data too. That stuff's not that hard. We're going to talk about workability because that's the hard stuff. As we change these gradations, we're going to see how it impacted the performance. And this is going to help us establish limits because we don't want to give people mixtures that don't work very well. So here we go. So here is percent retained, percent retained. Here is the sieve number. Now, one other thing I forgot to I forgot to mention is that everything under this curve has to total to what? 100%. Has to. That means if I go down in one place, like this is where I have 57 here, I have sand. If I go down here, I have to go up someplace else. That's a it it it's like a waterbed. Push down on one place on a waterbed. It's got to go up someplace else. That's a good Oklahoma analogy. I don't know if it works for Indiana or wherever you're at, but it works great here. So if I go down here, I got to go up someplace else. So if I'm going to drop the 57 and I'm going to increase the number eight or the intermediate size right here. And this, was, this had a poor workability right here. Just 57 in stone, poor workability. I dropped this a little bit and it got moderate. Oh, that's good. I'm going to drop a little bit more. Oh, got good. Oh, good. Good. Oh, it goes back to moderate. But power got poor again. I want you to pay attention. This trend is going to happen over and over and over again. We're going to go from bad to good to bad. If I have too much of something, it's bad. If I have too little of something, it's bad. If I have right just the right amount, it's good. That's what life's going to be about. That's what concrete's going to be about. That's what aggregate gradation is going to be all about. And the tarantula curve helps you figure out where the good is and where the bad is. As you can see here, I'm just to show this again. We started out, if I have too much of this, not good. I'm going to drop it down a little bit, increase this up. It got better. Now it's even better. It's still good. It's still good. Now it's getting moderate again. And then it got poor when this got too high. Poor again. And let's let's look at the slump values. If I was right here in the middle, everything was great. If I had too much of that intermediate, not good. If I had too high of the course, it's actually segregating. See the rock coming out of it? That's not good. So same thing about finishing. If I had just right in the middle, boom. Too much intermediate. Oh, look at that. It's all bony looking. Too much course. Oh, it looks bony again. Looks like it's going to be hard to finish. That rock is like coming out of the mix. The tarantula curve helps you get it just right. Now let's talk about valleys. Historically, in the concrete lore, people have talked about valleys. That's the low spot in an aggregate gradation. So I'm going to take the, a lot of folks also like to say that the asphalt people, I know they're bad and all, but they like to say that they steal our 3 8 aggregate. All right. I think they just pay more money than we're willing to pay for their 3 8 inch aggregate. But if you notice here, once this drops out, we're going to take this 3 8 and we're going to reduce it down to nothing. And look, it's still good. We basically just removed all the 3 8 out of the mixture, gave them all the asphalt people, right? Made a bunch of money, and we still have a good mixture. It still performs great. Now we're going to push the limits. We're going to take out all of the 3 8 See how this is zero? We're going to take all the 3 8 out. We're going to take this one all the way down to zero. Watch. Oh, and it's still good. What? Now, I'm not recommending this, but this is the key. See this 20% line? We never went over it. We never got too high. That's the key. Don't get too high. Don't get too low. And this critical line here is 20% where bad things start to happen. So as long as your percent retained was not more than the maximum boundary of 20% from the three-quarter inch to the number four, there was great performance in the concrete. 20% is the magic limit. But as soon as one started to go above that, that's when bad things started to happen. Segregation started to happen. So pumpers, if you have too much of any one sieve size up here, up here, this is when your life can get dangerous. When you have a whole lot of any one sieve size on, on, on the coarser size, that's when your life can get very dangerous. And these valleys are not a problem. They're not, as long as you don't get too high someplace else on, on the aggregate gradation. Now let's talk about sand. Now sand is something that we don't, as an industry, understand very well. But there's a guy named Duff Abrams, same dude that invented the slump cone, same dude that invented the water to cement ratio, pretty big stud in concrete lore. He also invented something called the finest modulus, the FM. 
and we use it today still. And I think the finest modulus is really cool. What it does is it takes an entire curve, gradation curves, and expresses it as one number. And I think it was a great idea in 1916. And I think for natural sands, I think it's still great. But with modern sands, blended sands, manufactured sands, um, even some of these weirder sands that I'm starting to see, I don't think the finest modulus is the best way to look at our sands anymore. Let me explain what I'm talking about. This is percent retained over here. These are the sieve sizes. This is these curves. All of these curves have the same finest modulus, 2.54. And the curves all look pretty similar to one another. But guess what? All of these curves have the same finest modulus, but very, very, very different percent retained. I don't know. In life, it's kind of hard to take one number and describe anything, like a person. How can you do that? They're, they're, that's too challenging. And sand is becoming that way in our industry. It's much more complicated than it was in 1916. So FM is useful, but it's challenging to do our sand gradations with a single number. And, and, and in, the, in the coarse aggregate world, we usually think of large and intermediate stone. Why don't we do this with sand? Well, some people do, and we're gonna, we're gonna really push this idea. This is a very big concept. We're gonna find there's something called coarse sand larger size sand and that's between the number four and the number 30 and then there's something called fine sand and that's between the number 30 and number 200 and they're responsible for different properties in the concrete i'm going to explain this and show this to you coming up so let's talk about the coarse sand first that's the number eight through through the number 30 and it's going to talk that's going to be important for finishability and also something called cohesion holding the mix together which is also important for pumping so what, this is one of my favorite slides, okay? If you open concrete textbooks today, I don't know how many of you read concrete textbooks, but I've got a whole stack of them by my bed. And you open them up and you start looking at them. You start looking at the, what, what the textbooks say about these different things, especially about aggregation. The textbooks say that the, the ideal, the ideal aggregation is this yellow one this bell-shaped curve. And the reason why is that the textbooks aren't based off real life. The textbooks are based on spherical aggregates at a perfect packing inside the concrete. Well, concrete's not like that. We actually made the ideal gradation, this bell-shaped curve. We made it right out of the textbook. We sieved it to make this curve and it was awful. It was horrible. It was some of the worst concrete I've ever seen in my entire life. And this curve right here, it was great. It was awesome. Not even close to this ideal bell-shaped curve. Just goes to show you the textbooks aren't always right. And we said, well, what was wrong with this? Well, in this bell-shaped curve, um, this is what that, that float test looked like before finishing. And after eight passes, it looked like this. After 20 passes, it still looked horrible. It just didn't finish well. And that was a big game changer for us. So we said, okay, okay, we're going to sieve our sand. I'm not saying we should do this in real life. We did this as an academic exercise to learn. So we're going to sieve out the sand and add it back in gradual amounts so we can see what, what goes on. We're basically going to do the same teeter-tottering thing I showed you before. If we have too little of this sand, it was poor. If we got in the middle, it was good. If we got too high, it was bad. What happened? Well, let's talk about the poor f finishability. Um, and this all comes back to that same um, finishing test I was telling you about before. At zero passes, it looked like this. At eight passes, it looked like this. See this, this little carved out portion in the surface? This eight and 16, this, this inter intermediate sieve sizes right here, they're critical. If there's too much of them, they actually float to the surface. And as you're finishing back and forth, you actually scar and ruin the surface finish of your concrete. After 18 passes, we finally got a decent finish. That is not acceptable. Not acceptable at all. They'd be adding water. They'd be cussing. They'd be doing all kinds of stuff. That's not the kind of concrete that we want to give people in the field to use. So let's talk about, so we want to avoid this. Let's talk about poor cohesion. If you have not enough of this 8 or 16, do you remember that segregation problem I told you about? It comes back. This is what that concrete looked like. It, this is inside a wheelbarrow, you dumped it out. All this rock is here and all this paste is over here. If you don't have enough of this intermediate aggregate, 
it segregates. And again, that is a huge problem with pumping. So the tarantula curve helps you get safer mixtures for pumping as well. So this coarse sand, you need a minimum 20% retained on this eight to 30. And for finishability issues, if I get above 12% um, on this eight and 16 sieve, you get finishing issues. Oh, okay, 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 okay. We got a curve, I get the curve. And you want your combined gradation to be in the curve. I get that, okay. But how in the world do you check your coarse sand? Well, number one, you say, is it within the boundary? Yep, check, that looks good. Number two, you add these three sieves, the eight, the 16, and the 30. You add them together. The eight, how much is on them? The 16 and the 30, and you say, is it greater than 15%? If that's a yes, that's good. If it's a no, that's bad, don't worry. Spreadsheets will do this for you. So we're basically gonna say, what's the volume underneath here? Eight, 16, and 30, that's the same number, 25.6, and that is what gets plotted in this oval. Remember that oval I showed you up above? Yep, that's that oval, and that number's gotta be greater than a certain value. Okay, so coarse sand is important for finishing and cohesion, and we talked about this, these limits and how to get that figured out. Now let's move into our friend, the fine sand down here at the bottom, fine sand. So we're, we're gonna do the same type of thing. We're gonna teeter-totter. We're going to decrease the amount of sand, and we're gonna increase the amount of coarse aggregate. Basically bring this down, increase this up, teeter-totter. So we can all say what we think is gonna happen, Let's just do the data. Let's just do the 650 concrete mixtures and see what it tells us. So this is gonna go down, it's gonna be poor, it's gonna get better. Good, good, good. Guess what happens? Moderate and then poor again. So this just says there's a range. If you have too much sand, it's a problem. If you have too little sand, it's a problem. Same stuff I talked about before. Excessive amount of sand, it's a hairy, nasty mess. You don't have enough sand, it looks like a bunch of paste covering rock. You gotta get this right amount and the tarantula curve helps you do this really, really easily. And again, here's the slumps, too much sand, not enough sand, man, that's dangerous. And right, right amount, right here in the middle, booyah, that's the concrete we want. And again, in airplane mode, so I can't help you with that at the moment. This sand is an issue. Um, and so we're, 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 we're gonna keep going. So. We're gonna to try to develop a fine sand range. This is just taking this type of information and plotting it. Just something like this. If you have too little fine sand, it gets bad. If you have too much fine sand, it gets bad. You wanna be in this sweet spot in the middle. So how do I do this? How do I check this? Well, number one, are you within the boundaries? That's, that looks good, that's a thumbs up. Number two, we're gonna add these sieves again, the 30, yes, 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 the 30, you add it again, the 30, the 50, the 100 and the 200, the 30, the 50, the 100, you add them up, add them up, add them up, 28.2, and you see, where does it fall? Does it fall within my range, right? And if I'm looking for flowable concrete, pumpable concrete, bridge deck type concrete, 25 to 40% is what, I, what, what that range is. If I'm looking for slip forming, it's, for, it's between 24% and 34%. Slip forming needs more cohesion, so you have to have a little bit tighter range. Oh my gosh, I just told you all about the tarantula curve, all the boundaries, why they exist, what they're about. But how about these other mixture design procedures? How about the Power 45? How about the Shillstone chart? How does that fit into everything? Maybe you've heard about those, maybe you haven't. Let me explain those to you. Let's talk about, about the Power 45. On the Power 45, you plot the percent passing over here. And over here, um, Okay, and over here you have the sieve number. So on this black line is the perfect, perfect, ideal um, mixture. And um, let's just start plotting some numbers here. So um, this is where these different curves fall, and all of these perform poorly. These are all poor workability, all these red ones. So they're not very close to that black line. Some of them poor moderate, poor moderately. So they're kind of in the middle, not, not quite there. And these are all good. These had amazing workability. And are they getting closer to the black line? I don't know. I'm not so sure. Here's a, actually a red one. This red one is a poor mix. It's right in the middle of all the black, right in the middle. And it had 
poor performance. And I can't even tell a difference between it and the other black lines. So what's going on here? And, and the Power 45, I think there's something there, but it's kind of complicated to understand. You have to understand how the slopes of these lines work. So using a best fit line on the Power 45 doesn't show you enough detail the changes of slope in, in, in this gradation line. It doesn't address the volume of the fine or the coarse sand as well. The tarantula curve just makes this easier. So there's another uh, a tool out there called the coarse factor chart. You have this workability factor that takes into account your sand content and the amount of cement you have. And you have this coarseness factor, which is calculated, which is really the ratio of your coarse aggregate to your intermediate aggregate. And you plot it on, this, on these boxes. And the idea is to be in this center box. At least that's the most concept. So I'm going to do a lot of mixtures. Some of them are poor. Those are the ones in red. Some of them are moderate and some of them are good. And I want to look at these two right here. These two that are right next to one another. One of them is good and one of them is poor. Now this, this tool tells us they should be the same. They should literally perform exactly the same. One is amazing and one of the best mixtures you'll ever see. And one of them is one that you would cuss at and I would never want anyone to pump this. Because if you look at the gradation. There's, there's um, some things that are missing in the Shillstone chart. I mean, I'm a big fan of Shillstone. He was a huge inspiration to me. He did a lot of amazing things, but there's some tweaks that need to happen that the tarantula curve takes care of that this one doesn't. Here's the poor mix, here's the good one. So in summary, the Power 45, the courses factor and the 818, they're a good start, but they're not complete. The tarantula curve is a simple design tool it's been specified in Texas, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Utah, and Minnesota. And I think Indiana's working on it as well. Um, there's a lot of other states that are talking about it. Why do people do it? Because it works. And how can I prove that it works? Well, let me tell you a story here. This is the state of Minnesota. In 1996 to 1998, they started to say, hey, we want to pay more attention to our aggregates. Our performance is all over the place. We're not happy with it. We want our mixtures to get better. And, and so this is the tarantula curve, and this is where their gradations fell, all over the place, just literally a mess all over the place. But by 2009, 87% of their mixtures, they gave an incentive using the Shillstone Power 45, some other things, they gave an incentive, we want to pay more attention to our aggregates. They give an incentive to, to use more aggregates and pay attention to these. 87% of them were inside the tarantula curve. Well, by, by 2010, 98% of their mixtures were inside the tarantula curve. Now, let me tell you well, the most amazing thing about this story. In 2010, the tarantula curve didn't exist. Contractors aren't stupid people. Contractors are going to not use stuff that doesn't work. And they are going to use stuff that does work. And they're going to tweak over time again and again and again and again to make things better and better and better. And what they saw over time in Minnesota, when they had people pay attention to their aggregates, more and more mixtures were entering the tarantula curve without the contractors even knowing about the tarantula curve. They were finding these bounds on their own. Now, if we also plot, this is the percentage of the mixtures within the tarantula curve. And this is the smoothness. So we can see here, here's where not very many, things get better and better and better. The smoothness of their pavements got better and better and better as more in their mixtures got inside the tarantula curve. So Minnesota contractors are producing gradations that are within the tarantula curve. They're having good success with them. They're doing this by trial and error. No knowledge of the curve. And as more mixtures are entering the tarantula curve, the smoothness of the pavement is improving. I've got similar data for Iowa and Michigan, but it all looks about the same. So, 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 so this is a great question. Okay, I've got a mix. I got these gradations. How do I get my mixture into the tarantula curve? Well, usually you need at least three different aggregates. Not always. I've seen it done with two, a coarse and a fine, but usually you need three because you need levers. If one of them is out a little bit, you reduce that lever and you raise the other two up. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So like I was saying, if one of them is out, you use these other two to bring it back in. So if, if this one is out, we're gonna decrease this to bring it down. We're gonna increase this to bring it back. As Soon as it's in, thumbs up, everything is great. So do my mixtures have to be in the curve? No, no, they don't have to be. 
But if they're not, you're going to need more paste or you're going to need more admixture to make it a workable concrete if you're out. This usually means more cost. This usually means a greater risk for cracking. And so a lot of people want to avoid this if they can. So let me give you a story, um, a case study, hence. Um, the New York ACI chapter said, hey, Tyler, we'd love you to come up and give a talk about the tarantula curve. And I said, okay, that'd be great. I'd love to. And they said, but we're not totally buying it. And I was like, okay, well, how could I convince you about it? They said, well, let's give you a mix and see if you can improve upon it. So I said, sure, not a problem. So they gave me a mix. And what they didn't tell me is that the contractor had spent about 30 trial batches improving and making the mix the best they possibly could. They'd already used it on a bridge deck the summer before. Everyone thought it was great. They thought it was an amazing, amazing mix. But they sent it to me. And so it looked like this. Had a certain amount of coarse, certain amount of intermediate, certain amount of fine, certain amount of cement, fly ash, all that stuff like that. I went into my spreadsheet, the same spreadsheets I'm giving you for free on the website I showed you before. And literally within about 20 minutes, I put their stuff in, boop, 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 came up with a mix design. I cut out 50 pounds of total binder. I said, hey, trial batch this one. Let me know how it goes. They're like looking at it. They're looking like it's, it's not going to work. What I did was I, this is what the mix they gave me. Now I got lucky. They gave me a mix that was already out. It had too much number four in it. And all I did was say, how do I fix this? No, 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 not a problem. I'm going to lower this down and raise these up. That's all I did. Lower it down and raise them up. And as soon as I did, I said, I knew I could save them on binder. I knew if they were happy before that I could reduce the binder and they're still going to be happy. So 550 pounds. 550 pounds was a good guess. They were at 600 before. 550 to 560 is a great guess for a first guess for a bridge deck. If I'm doing a pavement, a great first guess is about 470. All right. And you can tweak that based on some other things we can talk about if you want to. So how do you know where to put your peaks? People ask me this question. How do I know? How far away do I want to be from the edge? Do I want to be in the center? How do I know? I think they're just nervous. Well, we know that these gradations are going to vary a little bit. So I don't like my curve to be just within the peak. I like my curve to be some distance away from where this, this, this boundary is. And if I do that, then I feel much better about as these varies during the production of the job, I'm not going to go out. Because if I put this right here, then 50% of the time I'd be out of the tarantula and 50% of the time I'd be in the tarantula. And who wants that? I want to be in the tarantula all the time. I want to produce great concrete all the time. So they trial batched it. And I said, okay, I want you to trial batch it with no admixture. Why? Because I want to see how much slump I have with just water. They did that. That's what it looks like. Not much. And I said, okay, add your typical amount of high range water reducer. They did that. They got about four and a half inch slump. So they added just a dash more, just a little bit more. They got a seven inch slump. That's what they're happy with. They thought that looked good. They were excited about it. I've got a video I'm not going to show you, but they actually try to get it to close and finish. They dump it out. I love this video because they say, and they say, ah, look at this. There's no way it's going to work. And they used a curse word there that I'm not going to repeat. And then they started to finish it and it closed right up and they said, Son of a beep, another curse word, another great classic video. Closed up, they were pretty happy with it. So they used it in the field. They were super excited. They, they used it in the field. They thought it was great. Contractor was super excited that they got a better improving mixture. So how about shrinkage? People love to ask me this question. How does this, can, does this reduce shrinkage? Does the tarantula curve reduce shrinkage? Only if you reduce paste. The paste is what shrinks. If you don't reduce paste, you will not reduce shrinkage. But how would I recommend or, or estimate how much shrinkage I'm reducing? Because shrinkage means cracking. Cracking is bad, right? So if I have 20% SCM in my mix, like a fly ash, and I have a constant water to cement ratio, what I have found this is a rough estimate, rough, right? It, for the percent reduction in binder, that's about the same percent reduction in shrinkage I got. So if you go from 650 pounds down to 550 pounds, that's about a 15% reduction in shrinkage that you can expect to have. That might help you make decisions on the durability side. 
So the tarantula curve was used to redesign aggregations and successfully remove binder. This new mixture seems to be, have good workability with a high range water reducer. The gradations could be improved if I had a larger aggregate, but I didn't have one available. Um, so does aggregate shape matter? Um, Dan asked me to talk about this. So all these three mixtures, this, this aggregate with this aggregate, this aggregate are the same. The same, we may, we sieve them to have the exact same gradation, the exact same cement, the exact same water. Everything was the same. It was within the tarantula curve. It was great. But this mixture, this cubic, this crushed cubic shaped limestone required zero water reducer to get a four inch slump. This one, this river rock was more flat and elongated. Three ounces per hundred weight is what it required to get a four inch slump. Not that bad, not that bad, but it required more than this one. But this flat and elongated, this flakier, flat shaped material required 6.9 ounces per hundred weight. Quite a bit more than zero. What's the difference? It's about the flat and elongated um, shape of the particles. And guess what? We have a test to measure that. It's called the ASTM D4791 test. And what it does is it measures the long dimension to the short. Don't understand? The long dimension to the short dimension. And it gets this, this is called the flatness ratio. Now we found the magic flatness ratio for concrete is three to one, three to one. And if you have less than 15% retained on this three to one, that means less than 15% of your particles are these flat and elongated, booyah, you're in business, everything is great. If you don't, you're probably going to need another half sack to a sack of cement to make your mixture work. It just depends on the shape of your, of your particles. But this is the magic number. One to three ratio, less than 15%. Everything is great. So do my aggregates have to meet this? No, no. But you're going to need more paste to get a satisfactory workability if you don't. So why would you do all this? Well, I, I promise you, I have seen it. DOTs are going to it. Contractors are using it. People are excited about reducing cost, about improving their strength, about improving their durability, about improving sustainability and controlling their mixtures. And that's why people are using it. So when mixtures are workable, every single person in the entire concrete industry, their life improves. This means it's going to be easier to place, drag, consolidate, finish, pump. This means the mixes aren't going to have to be adjusted on site. It's not going to be, give me 10 gallons, all right? You're not going to have to do that as much. It's not going to be blessing the top of the slab and working it in. You're not going to have to do that anymore. It's just going to come the way you want it. You can just use it. But what does this mean? What does this really mean? Aggregates are critical to the performance of your concrete mixtures. 75% of the volume. Simple tools like the tarantula curve can be very helpful to help us improve our mixtures. And if we get our aggregate right, it's easier to control the performance of our concrete, I swear to you. And getting your aggregation right is the first and most important step to success, in my opinion. Add mixtures are great. More cement is great. But, but let's do that with starting from a great aggregate mixture to begin with. Reducing our paste content in our mixtures provides many, many benefits to our concrete. So with that, if you have any questions, you know, I've got a YouTube channel that's all about concrete. If you've never watched it before, you should check it out. YouTube.com forward slash Tyler Lay. Um, I get about um, 10,000 views every day from people all over the world. Maybe you can be one of them. Please like, subscribe, leave me a comment. I talk about tons of stuff. There's about 300 videos up there about all kinds of things concrete. Um, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at concrete.tyler. Yep, I'm that big of a freak. And there's my personal website at tylerlay.com. You can email me. You can call me. You can do whatever you want. I love concrete. I hope you do too. If you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Tyler, thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, nobody really sent any comments to me, so I'm hoping that people have a lot of questions. And if not, uh, Dan McCoy is here to ask all the other ones that people won't. 
I got one on my, really quick. Jason Watt, Watt sent me a good one. He says, most ready mix suppliers are reluctant to use the 3 8 material as an intermediate aggregate due to cost and number of bins. I totally agree, Jason. I, I know what you're talking about. Most ready mix suppliers have a bin with rounded pea gravel, 3 8 Can pea gravel be used as an, as an intermediate aggregate? Yes, it totally can, Jason. Totally can. Thank you for presenting. Oh man, I appreciate it. Thank you for the great, great, for the nice compliment, Jason. Um, yes, Jason, anything you can do that has the size distribution that I talked about on this tarantula curve, um, anything that you can get that'll fit that, um, I'm trying to go back here, um, you, you're going to be good. Um, yeah, for some reason, my thing is not, there we go. We're just going to roll up here. Um, Larry, why don't you start filing off some other questions at me? Anything you can do to get yourself in here, brother, you're, it's going to be a good place. You can use pea gravel. You can use lots of stuff. Sometimes you can use larger stone. Sometimes you can use smaller stone. It's all valuable. Thank you so much for the question, Jason. Any other ones? Uh, Tyler, I've got a quick one when it comes to, um, we're, we're just, we're having a lot of experimentation right now with um, overlays, as, uh, specifically silica fume overlays. And uh, it looks like in NDOT we're doing additions instead of replacements for SEM. So we do like a 7% or a 50 pound addition. So that puts our binder content right up at around 708 pounds. Yes, sir. Um, I, I kind of wanted to know your thoughts. Are we, are we playing with trouble there? Or what, what are other people looking at for those type of topping uh, concretes when they're looking for their binder content to maintain yeah, um, their, their permeability? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. So let me tell you about a project that I just did that's um, about five miles from my house. So I'm pretty proud of it because um, it's for the city I live in. And um, and we use the tarantula curve and um, we use 600 pounds of total cementitious material with a 20 percent fly ash replacement. Um, and um, we used uh, four pounds per cubic yard of a macro synthetic fiber in that mixture. And we got amazing, amazing, amazing performance. Um, they were, it was an overlay. Um, they were super pumped about it. There was, everyone was nervous and concerned. Everyone thinks it's very excited about it. They're, they're doing local talks about it. Um, 600 pounds, total cementitious. Um, and we used the tarantula curve to deal with the gradations but we did use uh, four pounds per cubic yard of a macro synthetic fiber. Um, the, I'm not sure what the thinking is in going to the higher binder content. I've had great success without going that high. Um, silica fume is a, is a very powerful material. I think you have to be very careful with it. I think it's something that can overwhelm your mix. Um, but if, if you, um, and, and I'm more of a fan of using something like a latex than I am um, silica fume. I think late to, I've had more success with it if you want to really reduce the permeability of an overlay. Um, but we could talk more offline. I mean, you can do it with silica fume as well. If I was going to do it with silica fume, I would still be at 600 pounds of total, total cementitious. Instead of using 20% fly ash, I would just use the 5% silica fume um, replacement. And I would probably just need to up my admixture dosage to make that work. Did that help? Yeah, yeah, that's that's. I, I just wanted your uh, your opinion, mainly from your experience. Um, and now that you've done one right right uh, next door there, that's that's fantastic. We're just looking for more outside the box thinking because um, it seems like you know we've been dealing with federal highway for a long time, and what we have been doing for a lot of DOTs is we've we've just kind of followed in footsteps without making any remarkable changes because it's it's hard to make a change in civil engineering. Um, knowing that a mistake costs so much, so so they try to they tend to stick with what works, and then we, we have all these different admixtures and and different thoughts for mixed designs come along, and we really don't change our thinking too much, and I I think it's time to start looking into that. No, I agree I agree wholeheartedly, and I think going ahead, I would like to challenge all of us to start to experiment and think, and you don't have to do it on the on the big projects that matter. You can do it on a small project that 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 um you're not you're not as concerned about um or in your backyard or 
as you trial batch. I think one of the most amazing things that happened is when NDOT started to bring the tarantula curve to, to the um, Indiana industry, there were several ready mix producers that actually grabbed it and said, I'm not sure if I agree with it. I want to test this out for themselves. They grabbed the box test, they grabbed the float test, they ran some of the things themselves, and they verified it for themselves. My hats are off to them. I think that's what people need to do. They, I mean, they don't have to take my my word for it. Um, they should go out and prove it to themselves. Um, but I, I, Dan, I, I agree with you. I think thinking in new ways is really important. It's something as an industry we need to all be doing more of. The, and to for my pumping guys out there, and, and Gary will agree, over the last several years since, um, and it's really been a DOT-led initiative because you have to maintain CAP certification to be a provider to these ready companies for um, aggregate. Uh, so if if NDOT says, hey, let's try and meet this gradation, which is the tarantula curve, and it's really set up nice uh, through NDOT where you pick your sourcing um, and it automatically uh, collates whatever the gradation is. I mean, it's nice. fantastic. And then it plots it right there on what your tarantula is. And I think Gary would agree that pumping this concrete has gotten a lot easier and it's it's helped the private sector because mainly because these ready mix companies are pulling from the same aggregate sources. So now, so it's, it's funneled over since, since NDOT or the DOT has said, we would like you to have this gradation. Well, why would the ready mix company go and change it for a private uh, job or a commercial job if that gradations work? So it's flowing right into the private sector. That's awesome. That's great news. Any so Tyler, is it safe? To, is it safe to say that you know if you've got a really really good good tarantula curve, good gradations that you could potentially lower your cement uh, a small amount to actually help with uh, you know pumping and still still get the same results? Yes, sir. For sure. It's a big thing to say. That's <laughs> huge. <laughs> Tyler, yeah. Tyler, this is Gary here. Uh, one of the things the state of Indiana has been talking about uh, increasing the top size aggregate to a number four, which is like an inch and a quarter, inch and a half. How would that affect the tarantula curve and the other aggregates below it? If, That's a great question. If, That's a great question. Um, we actually have an um, ongoing research project to answer that right now. Um, we're bringing in, we've done some inch and a half type, type material. And just to kind of go back to what Gary is saying, just just if I, um, um, some people may not have everything memorized here. Gary is saying that what um, your state of Indiana has talked about using some more of this inch and a half stone. And right now the tarantula curve doesn't cover it. Um, and one reason it doesn't cover it, if I can get back to where we actually show it, is it wasn't in the scope of the original work. Yeah, it's just not in the scope of work. When when ODOT funded us to do the work, um, we they don't they didn't use larger stone, and so um, we didn't test it. We did test a little bit of stuff from Texas, um, and we found that the larger stone doesn't change much. Um, that the curve kind of goes down. Now, what does it look like over here? Well, if you give us about six months, I think we'll know the answer to that question, Gary. Um, but I, I'll what I what I can tell you is that I, I look at that larger stone as another option. It's, it's, you don't, it's an option. You don't need it, but you could use it if you needed to. Um, let me explain what I'm talking about. The so, thought process behind the larger aggregate, Tyler, was to reduce paste content or quantity. Uh, right, I understand. So one thing that we're doing for this, for this project coming up Gary, is um, we're actually comparing the pace content, the workability, the strength, and the durability with a larger stone and a smaller stone, um, and how, how they compare. We're not just doing it with one aggregate, we're doing it with four different aggregate sources, um, and we're actually comparing them. And we've done a little bit of work, and Gary, what we're finding so far, that um, as long as you're within the tarantula using smaller stone, there's no difference in performance. There's no difference in paste needed. There's no difference in workability. There's no difference in shrinkage. Now, I can try to explain on why I think that's going on and why I think that's happening um, if you want. But what we're saying is that this larger stone is an option 
Why I think it's an option is, is that if you noticed here, there was two options, this going down and this going up. Another option would be for this to go down and something larger to go up. Does that make sense, Gary? You follow me? Yes, yes. Okay. I think what Gary's concerned with Tyler is the, the fact that, you know, if you, if you try to take an inch and a half aggregate and put it inside of a four inch hose. Yes, that's, sir. That's yes, sir. Right. I, I, I agree with that. And I, I get concerned with that too. Um, and especially if you have too much of it. And Gary, I think we're going to have you a limit where you, you can be concerned about. What I would recommend is I don't think, in my opinion, we don't need larger aggregate. We need more intermediate aggregate. Um, in my, it, that's a very, that. that's a very that. tough blanket statement to make. Okay. Um, that's a, I don't want to say that applies for every single situation, but it, by and large, I, if I had to choose, and actually it's funny you asked this question, Gary, because just earlier today, I was working with a contractor that was doing a job with a, with a job in Illinois. And he asked me the exact same thing. And he, he was like, well, don't we want larger aggregate? And I said, no, I'd much rather have this intermediate stuff. I'd much rather have this intermediate stuff, especially for pumping. Tyler, on the commercial side, uh, on super flat floors, they're pushing the larger aggregate for uh, uh, for shrinkage. And well, we're going to have some great we're going to have some, some we're going to have some great shrinkage data for them, Gary. And, and what I've seen so far, there's no difference in shrinkage between the larger aggregate and the smaller. And you say, whoa, whoa, how is that possible? Gary, what shrinks is the paste. Correct. And if the well, paste that's, that's is, is the same, if the paste is the same between the larger and the intermediate, the shrinkage is going to be the same. Make sense? Okay. Makes sense, yep. That's a great question, Thank though, you, Gary. I, I really appreciate that question. There, I know there's a lot of people that that's a, that's a question, you know, you know, in their mind. So th thank you for asking that. Anything else? There's 25 people on, there's gotta be a question. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this, with the tarantula curve and we're using cementitious replacements, the amount of time it takes to gain strength with some of these cementitious, some of the lower quality fly ash, some of the lower quality products, um, will this help with that at all? Because I know some of our fly ash that we're using now, we're not gaining strength till 56 days just because of very poor quality. Will this tarantula curve help with any of that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it can. Um, it can. So let me try to give you a short, concise answer. Um, as you get a better packing of aggregates together, you're going to get inherently a higher strength out of your concrete because you're gonna get better uh, bond. Uh, everything I just said there, or better interaction, better shearing action, everything I just said there only applies if you have a good aggregate source. If you've got an aggregate that's a little bit mm, shady, you know the ones I'm talking about, you throw them in a drum and you spin them around and they start to dust heavily, what I just said there is, isn't gonna help you. Um, but if you've got good aggregate, this getting intermediate, um, aggregate in 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 your mixture and um getting yeah getting more coarse aggregate in your mixture is going to help you with your early age strengths i have some good slides on that i just don't have them in this slide deck um so i could try to share more of that with you if, if you wanted to later but okay. the short answer is more rock in will help you with those early age strengths because the rock is giving you the strength does that make sense what i just said Yes, it does. And one one of the things we're facing locally is there's a lot of ready mix providers. They've got there's railroad cars full of fly ash. They just can't get them here. So they're running out of fly ash. They're running out of slag. And there's a lot of a lot of times where Indot said if if it's not available, if the SCM is not available, it's going to go pavement. I mean, go asphalt. And so we could potentially lose a lot asphalt, of concrete. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's one of the things that we're looking at here is if the fly ash and the slag is not available, you know, how can we we make it up with maybe a lower amount? What can we do? Because 
in dot you know they're really big into their their flash and slag mixes yeah um you know there's a lot of levers you can pull um to get durability if i was talking to ndot i would try to tell i would try to ask them look them in the eye and say what do you really want and they're going to say flat slash flash and slack and they're going to say actually you don't really want that you don't you don't want flash you want a low permeability concrete so if i match if i give you something that's a con that's a comparable low low permeability concrete will you be happy and hopefully they'll say yes and then if, if you do, now we can do things like reduce water to cement ratio. We can do things like um, reduce paste content. Maybe you put a little silica fume in. Yeah, I know you're like, wow, silica fume and paving? It may be better than asphalt and, and, and not 5%. <laughs> you know? Maybe you put in, maybe you put in 2% and, and you could actually do some testing to show that yeah, this is gonna actually give me comparable comparable permeability. So you start to ask, have questions. I mean, Dan brought up something earlier. I loved what he said. He said, we're in a different era. We can't keep doing things the old way. A lot of these things are gonna change. I know that's scary, but we have a ton of engineering tools out there to help us engineer our mixtures to give people what they want. What we can't have is people saying, I want 20% fly ash and I want it now because maybe we can't get it. If we can get them instead to say, I want permeability. Great. What permeability do you want? How do you want to measure it? Let me help you find a way to give you that. Would this be acceptable? You follow what I'm saying? Yep, totally. It's, a, um, it's the perfect answer we needed. We have somebody that asked a question. Yep. It is. Um, is 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 it Mari's question? Is how do you convince a ready mix supplier? Yep. 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 Okay. So Mari, that's a great question. Um, that is an amazing question, and I don't have an amazing answer other than and you guys on the if anyone else in person can chime in. But Mari's question is how do you convince a ready mix supplier that he or she needs more bins to add various size aggregate? Let's say they only have two, and you want them to get another one. Um, now, I don't think you need more than three, personally. Personally, I don't think you need more than three bins. Um, I think that's all you need that I've seen. Um, now, so you need them to get one more. Well, um, you need to encourage them that they're going to pay that bin off. So you can say, well, how much is it going to cost? You know, how long is it going to take? Can I commit to you? to use that bin for some amount of time? Can I get to the industry? And this goes back to what they were talking about before. If you can get a DOT to say, you, if you want to bid our work, this is what you're going to do. It, gives over the, it gets over all this inertia really fast. If they don't want the work, then they weren't, they're not going to get the bin. Um, and and I, I wish there's a better way. Maybe you guys can help me with a better way to say that, a different way to say that. Anyone else have a kinder, gentler way to say that? No, it's, it's, I think you hit it right on the head. I mean, other than saying it's quality driven, you know, DOT is yep. interested in quality, longevity, serviceability. Um, and we're saying, DOT is saying that if, if you want to be a supplier to what we do, then, yep. you know, you've got to pull from these aggregate sources and you have to make a mix like this. And it's not like there's a whole wide range of mixes on any DOT. They're very simple. Right. Um, so what they can control is the quality of the materials in the mix. Um, they don't get crazy with admixtures and chemicals. They they do just control the those those types of materials. And if they can control those materials and say you're free to do whatever you want for anything else, the ready mix supplier usually looks at that and says, well, if we want to do DOT work, um, this is what we have to have. And like I said, if they're already set up for that, they're going to make their mixed designs work in the commercial industry. So then you then you get into to other things, um, you know, for for your high rises with lightweight structural stuff, where maybe they do have a special pond for some some lightweight aggregate or something like that, or or bag micro micro uh, or silica fume. But but I I think that a lot of the suppliers that I talk to. They kind of go by that, you know. We go by our certified sources. That's where we're going to buy our material, our raw material from. 
and then that's where we're going to put it. Um, and they normally don't change out bins or, or different stuff if they're doing a commercial job versus a DOT job. They're making the same concrete. They're just using, as you brilliantly stated in one of those uh, slides, they're just using, you know, different contents of that raw material to make concrete. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not that hard. It's sand, water, <laughs> cement. Um, it's just real easy to screw up. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, no, I, I think that's a good point. And, and so I know um, um, we just got to keep talking. We just got to keep, keep people moving ahead. And, and, and Larry, I, I just want to go back to what you said about, about fly ash. I mean, you'd be amazed what 1% silica fume will do as far as um, um, acceleration to a mix, right? One, one, one to 2%. Right. I mean, you, you'd be amazed what it can do. And you, and people have never thought of it before because they really haven't needed it before. So. Well, here, here with NDOT, we are, we're doing a lot of bridges. We, we've been on with Dan, we've been on probably 10 to 12 recently. And, you know, they're either 7% silica fume or 3%. And, you know, the volatility, we known what it is in the past. We've been able to slow it down and get it under control at this point. But, you know, there's that, that underlying fact that, you know, there's a lot of unknowns with it because we're at such high levels. We're doing some research on it right now with the state of Indiana telling them what, you know, what we're seeing with the mix. And they're like, well, we've never tested that. We've never looked at that. So there's a lot of things we're discovering right now at the, the 7% threshold. Yeah, 7% seven, seven is pretty scary to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what, and keep in mind, that's not a replacement. That's an addition, addition. to. That's what can get that's us upwards of 700 plus pounds. Yeah, there, we're up around 700 pounds cementitious, and it just makes me makes me scared. That's pretty high. It's pretty high. Yeah. <laughs> now the bridge decks are doing great with three percent, and that that's also in an addition too. It's not a replacement. Um, so you're you're you know you're up around. Uh, well, well, it's it's still pretty high, 680 or uh, somewhere around there, but th they do behave a lot better in a bridge deck, in a mass pour. Um, yeah, and I would think it might have something to do with the lower dosage of silica fume, but I have to do some work to know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tyler, any other questions? questions? There was, there we got was, one more in the room. We got, we got one more question. Not a problem. If you're, gonna if you're gonna reduce water cement ratio and you're gonna reduce the cement in a mix, would you say that it would be paying attention to the gradation and the aggregate would directly reflect pumpability? Okay, so you just asked a really loaded question. So let me <laughs> let me let me, um, let, me let me try to. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the general answer first. Paying attention to gradation is always a good idea in anything you're ever going to do in concrete. Okay, I will tell you that. As you start to push the limits and you start to reduce paste or reduce water uh, or cement or both, paying attention to aggregates becomes even more essential, right. becomes even more important. Because what you're doing is that binder do, it doesn't, it, it, it's the lube that keeps everything moving. And if you remove that lube, you've got to get the rest of the part of, of, the, of, of the body right you got to get that all lined up and the way the way it should be so definitely as you start to reduce paste and 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 or water the gradations become even more important thanks yeah anyone else have questions david lawson had a nice thing to say david hey man i appreciate you brother Thanks for watching. Glad you liked the videos. And um, thanks to everybody else. I'd like to just thank Larry for having me back, man. This is very few people that asked me back ever twice. You would ask me back twice <laughs> in about 30 days. So it's a. Well, Tyler, I've got big plans for you. Yeah, I, I think you'll be doing it more often than you think. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see. I hope as long as I can contribute, I'm happy to try to help you guys out. Um, Indiana is a great state. You guys. Got some great, great people, great concrete people from your state, and um, I'm happy to be part of it and uh, help out however I, I possibly can. We appreciate it. We really do. And thank you from the Indiana ACI and the American Concrete Pumping Association. Thank you very much, Tyler.
Yep. Thank you, guys. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Send me that list, Larry. I got to run quickly. Nope.